Formula E's Gen 4 car has finally been unveiled to the public, and man, is this something to get excited about. In today's video, I'll be going over the car, the stat sheet, and giving you my honest thoughts on the future of electric motorsports debuting late next year. So first of all, let's just look at the aesthetics. Now I'm someone who absolutely loved the Gen 2 car. I think it was one of the most beautiful race cars to ever be manufactured, and I know a lot of people can agree with that. It was the perfect image of what a futuristic electric race car should be, and it set FE apart from other motorsports. When the Gen 3 came along, especially the first iteration of it, I was pretty disappointed. It was simplified down a lot, given a lot more flat space and a lot fewer curves and stylistic elements. As a result, it really came down to the individual liveries to make the car look good, and well, some teams did it better than others. It did grow on me over time, but the Gen 3 Evo was definitely an improvement. But again, I feel like it needed a few more stylistic elements to aid the car aesthetically. But the Gen 4 car has definitely delivered on that. This thing looks beautiful. I know the aim was to look a lot more like a traditional formula car, and it definitely does that, but I feel like there's still enough here to allow FE to have its own recognizable look. I can't wait to see how liveries look on this car, there's a lot of potential here. First off, we obviously got the two-tiered front wing, which is an absolute staple of FE and something I'm glad was brought over. It definitely helps with the overall strength of the wing, and this little cutout on the side is honestly a pretty cool touch. Moving back, we obviously have the brand new Bridgestone tires, and looks like they're promoting the Enlighten brand. There were talks of potentially bringing in a slick tire for the first time in FE history, but in the end we stuck with at least a somewhat treaded tire for the primary, but there is a full wet option that I believe is planned to be used as well. Which is nice obviously, they can optimize grip a lot more for their primes if they don't have the threshold of extreme rain to deal with, so I'm expecting these to be a lot better and deliver a lot more traction than the Hankooks. Looking at it from overhead, it looks very Gen 2, which I absolutely love. The next portion are these side pod elements, which I'm honestly not too sure about yet. I would have preferred something a bit more like the Gen 2 had with its sponsor blocker as the IndyCar fans call it, but it doesn't look bad, it's a prime spot for sponsorship space at the very least, or maybe even the car numbers. Just behind that we have our rear wheel well bodywork, which for the first time in FE history I think is separate from the main bodywork of the side pod, which creates space for the air to flow through the rear suspension. Design wise, I'm definitely a fan of that move, it looks really good and so much better than the integrated wheel well on the Gen 3 Evo. And that brings us to the LEDs. So if you don't know, the LEDs are a huge part of FE as they tell you which power mode the car is in. On the current car, they're on the roll hoop, the halo, and rear winglets. But on this one, it looks like they've added LEDs to the rear wheel wells, a strip along the front bodywork between the wheels, and on the driver mirrors, which is a super nice touch. Personally, I do hope you also get it along the halo, but having these indicators more visually available is always a good thing. The driver interface monocoque area all looks pretty similar to the current car. The roll hoop and shark fin behind it is a bit more of a mix between the Gen 3 and Gen 2 Evo, but I've noticed that they kept the charging port back there, which is something I haven't really seen confirmed in their official documents. If Pit Boost is staying or not, I think this season will definitely be a decider in that. In the FIA technical regulations published a few months ago, they did allot 4.05 kilowatt hours to be added via fast charging, so just something to keep in mind. And this brings us to the rear of the car. Maybe the most drastic aesthetic change to the Gen 4 has to be this massive rear wing. Obviously very F1 inspired, but I think the natural curve to it looks amazing, especially from the rear where they've kept the regen lights in a kind of X pattern, which they absolutely didn't need to do, but I applaud them for it. It keeps the FE theme a little bit. But you will notice that the top flap is separated and does seem adjustable. I believe this is planned for the two aerodynamic configurations FE is implementing. They'll have a high downforce setup optimized for qualifying and a low downforce setup for race conditions. This is something I believe could be subtly changed in the previous cars through the use of the front wing flaps, but it looks like they're going to make a much bigger difference on the Gen 4, which is awesome to see. And speaking of which, the front wing flaps have been made much bigger on this car, so again, more room to adjust your downforce levels. Getting into the overall stats, this car is a beast. Max 600 kilowatts of power, which is over 800 horsepower. This thing has more power than a NASCAR Cup car, it has more power than a V8 supercar, it has more power than a Super Formula car. That upgrade alone, almost doubled from the max power of the Gen 3 Evo we have now, is seriously impressive. Keep in mind though, that's only the power used in attack mode and qualifying, and the race mode will be 450 kilowatts, which is closer to 600 horsepower, but still an incredible jump. A 200 horsepower gap between race mode and attack mode is pretty significant, but it should be aided by the fact that all-wheel drive is now permanent, which I'm sure the drivers will love in the wet conditions. Along with that, the battery has been increased from 47 kilowatt hours to 55 kilowatt hours of usable energy, and the regen has been increased as well from 600 kilowatts up to 700, so even more efficient in terms of energy conservation. But that should only be aided by the massive aerodynamic improvements they've made on the car, including a massive underfloor as well. Just a few more tidbits for you, the overall construction is made from 100% recyclable materials and 20% recycled content, and the manufacturers that have committed to the Gen 4 so far are Porsche, Nissan, Stellantis, Jaguar, and Lola. 
The only one of the currents that haven't so far are Mahindra, and I believe there are even talks of Penske developing their own powertrains again. So I've gone through my positives, now for my more critical takes on the car. First of all, the size. According to the FIA technical regs released earlier this year, the car will be around 5,540mm long and 1,800mm wide. Comparing this to the Gen 3, 5,016mm long and 1,700mm wide, this car is so much bigger. I absolutely hate that. One of Formula E's greatest strengths was that the cars were small and nimble enough to make racing on street circuits exciting and make passes on permanent circuits even easier. The width I think is alright, since 1800 is the same width of the Gen 2, but the length is honestly super disappointing, over 300mm longer than the Gen 2. So we'll see. I know the plan is for the more powerful cars to be used on wider, more permanent circuits like Brains Hatch, but I feel like it'll definitely hurt the racing on tracks like Tokyo or even Monaco, which would be absolutely tragic. Monaco is our number one argument against F1 fans. It would be devastating if the passing were to shoot way down because the cars were just too big. Another concern I have is with the threat of aerodynamics taking over. What I mean by that is that currently in FE, aerodynamics aren't huge. You can run races with broken bodywork or lost wings and not be too handicapped. But with this new car, with it being so aerodynamically optimized, it'll absolutely make a difference, especially if you lose these front or rear wings. In addition, it should only increase the slipstreaming or peloton on permanent circuits. As being the head car, you're punching a much bigger hole in the air, therefore using more energy, and with the cars being a lot wider, there's more of an advantage to ride behind them. And with that huge rear wing, I'm also concerned about the effects of dirty air in the corners, or the turbulent air that often causes understeer in the cars behind. Maybe that's a trade-off that actually helps the car in front, but who really knows at this point. The car has also been made a lot heavier, 1,012 kilograms up from 856 on the Gen 3 and 900 on the Gen 2. Again, I know it's a necessary evil to contain all the batteries and the power improvements, but it'll just hurt the car's agility, especially with the longer wheelbase. I'm hoping the aero and grippier tires will aid in this fact, but only time will tell, I suppose. The final thing I'd like to do in this video is give a bit of a suggestion on what I'd mandate in terms of the livery. On the current car, the numbers are featured on the front between the wheels and on the rear charging port area. On this car, I'd suggest that in addition to these, also bring back the number on the lower half of the side sponsor blocker, just so that it's easier to identify which driver it is from the side. And speaking of identifying drivers from the side, why not bring back the old driver name board that used to be on the T-cam of the Gen 2? This was one of my favorite additions to that car, and for newer fans, it was super easy to learn who was in what car if you didn't know the numbers. So Effie, I definitely implore you to bring that back. But yeah, that'll about do it. This was definitely a quicker video than I'm used to, but I hope you all enjoyed it, and let me know what you think of the new car down in the comments. Very quickly, thank you to Chris over at Effie for the shots in this video, and thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next one.